Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, preserve in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Uh, we're in this, the midst of this love series, and we've seen uh, in our own society how love uh, can be narrowly defined in, uh, in a way that just lends itself more to, in terms of physical attraction, uh, conditional-based love. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. But we, uh, last week, today, and next week, are going to be taking a look at how the Bible discusses love in order to widen our understanding of love. So last week, we took a look at three different types of love, and the first type of love was eros. Uh, eros being a more passionate, desire-driven type of love. A love that uh, is fleeting, is conditional, and, uh, and a love that could fade over time. <clears throat> we looked at philia as well which often gets referred to as brotherly love. It's the love that exists between friends. And it comes up in a conversation between Jesus and his uh, disciple Peter, like really his, his right-hand man. Uh, and in that conversation, Jesus was asking Peter if he loved him. But the only type of love that Peter could respond with was, yes, Lord, I love you, but I love you as a brother. I love you with this friendship, this this commitment as a friend. I love you with brotherly love. So we, we looked at philia. And we also touched upon agape. And agape is a sacrificial, unconditional love. This is the type of love that God has for each and every one of us. And it's a love that we're going to be discussing more at length as we close out the series next week. Agape. But today, we are looking at a fourth type of word, a fourth Greek word for love, and that is storge. Storge. Uh, I actually, I, I clicked on a couple of different how do you pronounce uh, videos on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever had to go to YouTube to figure out how something's pronounced. One, uh, one site said storge, and I was like, that doesn't seem right. But I used, I used it one day, and somebody thought I was talking about storage, <laughs> like I needed more space for my stuff. And as I said, no, this, this has got to be wrong. So storge. Storge is the type of love we're going to talk about today. And what's interesting about uh, storge is that it only appears in the New Testament three times. That's it. Three times. Storge. It gets mentioned twice. Uh, it gets uh, it gets mentioned in the negative. Like it's it's conjugated in the negative. And, and, and to do that in Greek, you, you simply place uh, the letter A in front of it, right? You, you put the A in front of it. So, astorgus. Astorgus in Romans 1, 21, or in, and also in 2 Timothy 3, verse 3, which means no love, without love, that this person or these people have no love for another group of people, or they are a people without love, astorgus. So of the two of the three times that this Greek word storge gets mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament, two of the times it's mentioned uh, with sort of this negative connotation, gets conjugated in the negative. So there's only one instance of storge where it's conjugated as a positive verb. And we heard it a few moments ago from Tyler as he read from Romans. And in Romans 12.1, 
12, verse 10, it says, Love one another with mutual affection. Love one another with mutual affection. And another way to read it would be, Be devoted to one another in love. Right? Be devoted to one another in love. Love and devotion. And the type of love we're talking about here is nat a natural affection or devotion that you would feel for your family members. Right? Storge is all about love of family. The love that you naturally have for your family because they are kin, because they share the same blood, because you come from the same line or the same family tree. It differs from other types of love that, that we discussed last week, it differs from the Eros and the Philia and the Agape. But what's interesting about this particular passage out of Romans 12, verse 10, is that Paul, as he's writing about Storge, he finds a way to, to mash up two words uh, for love together. He mashes it up. He's like the Daft Punk of his day. He takes these two words, philia and storge, and wow. he uses them together in this verse. And so he actually uh, writes out philostorgos, philostorgos, which this is then for sure the only instance that philostorgos shows up in the entire Bible. The only time. And, and to me, what it does is, is by combining philia, which we discussed last week, is, is this brotherly love, this commitment to a best friend. By taking that and mashing it now with storge, which is a family love, uh, the love that you feel for a child or the love that a child feels for a parent, by putting those two things together, it is helping us get to a point where we can see uh, a friendship type of love turn into a family type of love. It helps get across the sense that as members of God's family, we are supposed to cherish one another and show mutual respect towards each other. Let, let me just show of hands, as a child, did you ever, did you ever, were you ever told by usually a parent you can pick your friends, and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. Okay, yes. I, I, I mean, I love that saying. I don't know exactly what it's trying to get across. Like, don't be gross. <laughs> don't, don't be gross. That's not right. Don't, don't pick your friend's nose. Uh, or is it... Y'all hear my voice right now, don't you? I'm blaming part of this on the weather and maybe part on... Just stuff I've gotten from family, I don't know. But I know that uh, that eleven months old, eleven month olds can have snotty noses. And you got, you know, as a dad, I'm the one that's gonna get in there, you know, like five percent of the time. Mama gets in there like ninety-five percent of the time with a wet wipe to wipe that nose, to pick that nose, right? You can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. And I guess to me, the point of the saying was that family could do certain things for family. And, and you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family, right? You're born into your family. The, the parents you have are the parents that you have. And, and so I've always read that, that you could, I've always read that phrase as meaning you could pick friends, but you couldn't pick family. And family could only do things uh, for you and help you and, and, and shepherd you in a way that only a family member could. But when we talk about having a spiritual family, when we talk about having a spiritual family, it seems as though uh, the understanding that you can't pick your family starts to change. If I can't pick my family, then, then what about this spiritual family? What about choosing to believe in God and choosing to follow Christ and choosing to walk alongside you? Because that starts to make us family. And we've been able to choose one another as we have all chosen to follow Christ. So the fact that, that Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, 
has taken philia and storge and he's mashed them together and he's made phila storgos. I think he's giving us a way to bridge the love of friends into the love of family. He's taken this love that has been uh, kept to the confines of friendship and he's given us a way to morph it and transform it and to smash it together so that we can start to look at one another as family members, so that we can cherish one another as kin. And perhaps what becomes tougher as we take a closer look at this entire passage is that Paul not only talks about love within the Christian family, but he's also talking about charity. He's also talking about justice. He's also talking about hospitality and showing love towards the stranger, right? Those who are on the outside looking in. Uh, or there's, there's another church planter friend that I have who is in Nashville. And the name of uh, their church is Home Church. Home Church, Nashville. And their mission is to provide a home for the spiritually homeless, right? How many of our friends living in, in, in our town could we say are spiritually homeless? And, and, and what is our responsibility as a friend? How do we invite them into the family? How can the love that we have for friends transform so that it becomes a love that we have for a family member? To be able to show love, to have acts of charity, uh, I think, it was, it was, might have been Friday, was Acts of Random Kindness Day. Did you know that? I, I didn't know that. Acts of Random Kindness. And yet, there were news stories, and I saw with my own eyes the way that people had love for each other on that day. The, the acts of kindness, the words of affection, the hugs and the kisses and the laughs, and the way that, that we treat one another, it shouldn't just be limited to one day. We should be able to do that every day. And through those acts of love and charity and kindness, strangers are able to become friends. There's a, a news story that I stumbled upon recently, and uh, it, it includes this man named Joe Monaco, uh, who lives in Texas. And Joe is an Air Force veteran. He's in his mid-80s. And back in 2013, he was driving his Cadillac when his sandal got caught under the accelerator. You know, I've always, I've always heard about like taking your, taking your sandals off when you drive. I am uh, guilty as charged to do that. And after reading the story, I'm going to have second thoughts about where my sandals are and, and what I'm wearing when I drive. Because his sandal got caught under the accelerator as he, was, as he was approaching his house. And he ended up crashing the car into his home, like into, into the garage, the outside of the garage. But not only did he hit the home, he also punctured a gas line. And so within seconds, the car was engulfed in flames and Joe was trapped behind the wheel of his car. So Joe's wife hears this loud boom. Her name's Patsy. And Patsy runs outside. And she's hysterical. She sees the flames. She's yelling, fire, fire, he's trapped in the car. Now, thankfully, James Rossburn, their neighbor, a former military medic, was home early from work that day. Just for whatever reason, his boss gave him at, uh, early leave. He told him he could go home early that day. And he heard the cries for help. And so he sprang into action. He went to the passenger side of that car and he went into a burning car and he pulled Joe out of the car and dragged him safely away from the house, away from the car and into the yard. And, and in the news story that I was reading, the reporter writes that Joe and Patsy's neighbor turned from stranger to hero. Stranger to hero. You know, this horrific event 
has had lasting physical effects on Joe. I mean, he still lives in pain. He had to have several skin grafts. But it also forged a friendship between Joe and Patsy and their neighbor, their hero, James. What I love most about the story is a line that's near the end of the article. The, Monaco, the Monacos look at James like he's a son. The Monacos look at James like he is a son. I mean, just take a moment to think in your life about adults who were there for you when you were younger and the love and care that they showed you and how some of them became like a second mom or a second dad or a big mama, right, or a papa. They might not have been related to you by blood, but they were family. And think about the others that the others that you have encountered throughout life, the co-workers, the neighbors, the classmates, that the experiences that you go through, as tragic as some of them might be, have helped to forge you together with them, have forged a friendship so that you can look to one another as brother and sister. And when we look at this passage, to love one another with mutual affection or to be devoted to one another in love, what I, what I feel as though Paul is trying to get across by using storge in this verb is he's saying, do what comes naturally. Do what comes naturally. Like the love that you naturally have for a daughter or for a son or how... James did what came naturally to him. He saved his neighbor. He, he jumped into the car through the passenger side and he rescued a man from certain death. Friends can become family and strangers can become heroes. So, in an attempt for us to practice storge, I thought that we could do something uh, that would encourage us to devote ourselves to one another and also to the potential family members who are still strangers, right? There's strangers that are outside this building that are at Starbucks or at Walmart or in bed or on the golf course. They're, they're, our, they're, they're potential family members. They are future friends who we will meet. Some of them we will meet this week. So in an attempt to devote ourselves to loving this group as family and to see strangers become friends, uh, it's going to involve us entering into an agreement with one another. So if you can, would you please stand as we join together in reciting a pledge? So go ahead, where you are. And you see the words here, and we're just going to read it together. We're going to go through it slowly, because I want you to, to realize what the words are saying, uh, what you are saying, what the words, uh, what they mean. And uh, this is coming straight from Scripture. So instead of reading it as a piece of Scripture, let's take a look at it as a pledge that we will make to God and a pledge that we make with one another. So uh, if we can, let's join together. In order for my love to be genuine, I will hate what is evil. I will cling to what is good. I will devote myself to others in brotherly love. I will outdo others in showing honor. I will not lag in diligence. I will be a fire in the spirit. I will serve the Lord. I will rejoice in hope. I will persevere in affliction. I will devote myself to prayer. I will contribute to the needs of the saints. And I will show hospitality to the strangers. 
Friends, keep standing. I pray that we will be able to remain committed to these words. And I pray that we will devote ourselves to love each other. Not because we get anything out of it. Not because we expect to get something if we're nice to one another. But because it's what comes naturally to us. You and I are friends. But we also have the same Heavenly Father. Which means that we are family. And isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to say? How about we say it together on three. We are family. One, two, three. We are family. All right, family. We're going to continue to worship God together as uh, we have our closing song. But something I want to say to you as uh, Tim and Jenny uh, come back up here is that if you want to learn more about this family that is called Peace Tree, if you're interested in becoming part of our tribe, then please come forward, find me during this last song, chat with me, or find me after our worship today out in the hallway, because I would love to talk with you more. We've, we've been a family for really 19 months now, and yet I can't imagine my life without these people. So I hope you'll find me, and I hope that we can join together in one voice as uh, we sing our praises to God. On that day when my sin is saved.